Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Mullen, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Library Management for the Digital Age, sponsored by Roman and Littlefield and featuring Julie Todaro, a librarian for over 35 years, past president of ACRL, and author of Library Management for the Digital Age, A New Paradigm, published this year by Roman and Littlefield. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the left-hand side, you will also see a Q&A panel that you can use to submit questions or comments. We'll spend some time responding to your questions during the program, so please feel free to submit these throughout. And finally, please note that today's program will be recorded and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on accessing the archived version. Dr. Julie Todaro has been a library manager for over 30 years and has experience in all types of libraries and library settings. She is a dean in a community college library, consults, presents workshops, is active in the ALA and her statewide association, and is an author and frequent presenter at conferences and in organizational settings. Julie is immediate past co-chair of ALA President Barbara Stripling's initiative, Libraries From Now On, and is author of the Roman and Littlefield 2014 title, Library Management for the Digital Age, A New Paradigm, 2009 Emergency Preparedness in Libraries, and with Mark Smith, the 2006 Training Library Staff and Volunteers to Provide Extraordinary Customer Service. She was awarded the 2012 Texas Library Association Lifetime Achievement Award, was the 2007 to 2008 Past President of the Association of College and Research Libraries, was the 2000 to 2001 Past President of TLA, re received the Austin, Texas 1999 YWCA Educator of the Year Award, and was the 1996 TLA Librarian of the Year. Julie received her Doctorate of Library Services from Columbia University and her Master's of Library Science from the University of Texas at Austin. Now I'd like to turn things over to Julie. Thank you, Laura. I consider Choice one of my primary management uh, documents and tools, and so I'm honored to be here uh, representing Choice today and uh, uh, discussing what I think is extremely important, and that is library management excellence in general and tools that I think are extremely helpful to people uh, as they're trying to manage. But telling you a little bit about yourself today, we have sort of an equal one-third, one-third, one-third split among frontline, middle management, and higher level administration, which is great. Majority of people are college, no surprise. And uh, I would say of the last poll question, or the second to the last poll question, people are most interested in finding tools to assist them in outcomes, in identifying outcomes for people, and in uh, sort of articulating outcomes in different ways. Number two, illustrating change. And three, uh, determining uh, different ways to communicate accountability for the organization. So, the uh, seminar today gives you five different approaches for visuals and aids to help you in articulating those elements. So let's get started. And I must tell you, the most painful part of any webinar is hearing that I've been around for 35 years. So beyond that, I'm, I'm going to say a few obvious things, and that is uh, library managers and, and librarians have an incredible uh, set of challenges today. And I have these, uh, not so much in any particular order, but certainly 
as librarians and certainly as managers, we, we very much concentrate and used to concentrate on the type and the size of library we were in. And I think that's a dramatically uh, significant change in that there are very few libraries out there that aren't in partnerships, consortia, relationships, community engagement projects, uh, determining grant partnerships and availabilities so that we really have to think beyond what we're doing in order to know about and communicate with and have successful relationships with different types and sizes of libraries. The tools that I present, I think, uh, help me a great deal in illustrating the types and sizes. So I think that's a major benefit of these. One of the reasons why I have changed on that question is because Libraries exhibit what I call dog year change. When I first started out in libraries, we tended to, and I'm just going to use this as an illustrating uh, point, we used to get in a, a, a five and a quarter, remember five and a quarter disc, and that was our info track. That was our citation for magazines. And as we moved through environments, what we then tended to have was an incredible uh, situation where we had um, not one five and a quarter disc, but two or three. So we had to do a tower. And then one day we opened the mail and there was a three and a half. And then we moved to towers and stacks and local area networks and wide area networks. And now we're on the dynamic web. And change occurs, I imagine, at a 7 to 1, that things used to change slowly, and now they change incredibly rapidly. Finally, the obvious, which is we need tools to help us illustrate change, to help us uh, articulate outcomes and our mission and vision, and do it in a compact, streamlined way so that tools uh, help us in partnerships, help us in just illustrating what we do, help us in articulating our values. We have uh, lots of tools available to us, but I picked five areas uh, to stand out for tools. And the first is, and I've, I've got a list here, so I'm going to really breeze through these, but we mentioned to you that you would have these after the, the uh, webinar. And then as we go through the webinar, I'm going to take number one and use examples, number two and use examples. So breathing through this first slide, the five tools or approaches or techniques, the first I have, and I have these in order of importance, I think, uh, if we can do that, profiling uh, those people around us, our employees, our workers, our constituents, our peers, individuals in the umbrella structure, individuals in our community. And in a minute, we'll talk about what we mean by defining or profile, and that is getting a handle on who they are for leadership, what leadership works with them, what communication works with them, et cetera. The second is something that I have a great deal of in my work, and that is case methods and scenarios. Storytelling is big in management, all the major management uh, schools absolutely use as their core foundation telling the story and then identifying issues and then solving problems and communicating uh, by using examples in case methods and scenarios are the primary areas of that case method being the first scenarios leaning more toward discussing uh, more brief situations but certainly postulating what the future might be. Visuals uh, are huge. Librarians and uh, library workers and library managers tend to be visual thinkers and visual, visual presenters. And I have some favorites. Paradigm shifts are among my most favorite. Paradigm and paradigm shifts. And I'll give you my favorite joke, which was someone gave me a t-shirt who didn't know me very well because I don't wear t-shirts. But I still have it. have it framed on the wall. And it is, do you have change for a paradigm? And I used to say I never am going to use this word because it's pretentious, but literally I think I use it every day. Grids, uh, my staff would laugh if they were listening. Grids to me are the way to my heart. 
presenting something in some kind of chart or graph or mapping to me is extremely important. And it's that, and I'll mention this later on, God knows not original with me or anyone in this century, one picture really is worth a thousand words. The fourth tool really focuses on data gathering and outcomes and ways to articulate outcomes which are required in almost every arena nowadays with a focus on illustrating value. Uh, and I have uh, an area which I'm going to point out to you specifically, and that is my first meaningful value that I think people need to illustrate is expertise of people. I think librarianship and libraries and resources and services are very important, but this doesn't happen without experts. And we need to constantly uh, consider the credentialing of ourselves and our profession and what we do. And then, of course, presenting the value of services, resources, and facilities. And finally, the fifth category for me is choosing terminology to articulate the data and directions, those data and directions. And I'm, I'm, uh, that's an obvious one. I'm sure most of us do this, and some of us do this unconsciously or subconsciously is more appropriate, and maybe unconsciously nowadays. But definitely looking at the terminology and why we have to look so closely at that. So let's look at each one of these individually. The first one is the need to define or profile people uh, who we uh, have and what we do. And I divide that profiling, internal populations, external people, partners, into two categories, why and how. And the why is pretty obvious here. And um, we're looking at black and red. And what red is focusing on here is the concept of the critical target audience uh, and with the focus there being the target audience, so that we profile in order to narrow down and match what it is that we do. And I have a pretty strong statement here that it's very important to gather advocates to your side. It's very important to continue to, to work with those people, continually update them on what we do, but we need to move beyond that first ring and make sure that we're not spending a lot of our time or too much of our time preaching to the choir, but instead reaching out to those people who are that moving target who we have a, a harder sell for. And my comment, which is the majority of my management time should be spent creating content, not necessarily only for me, but for my staff to, to push out to other people. And the uh, synonyms inform, persuade, and convince. I think persuade and convince are more synonyms, certainly. And inform is the foundation for that. And this, this is what we have to focus on, is getting their attention, providing a level of awareness, informing them of what we do, and then persuading them to our side, and then convincing them that this is the direction to go in. How is uh, the uh, real crux of what we're talking about here? How do we use those tools? And I still think best practices and effective practices, but I'm going to push you to a different category here, not just of the organization in general or the description of the service or the type of resource delivery, but specifically of data and content that creates the awareness, attracts other people, and makes a point. So what I think is extremely valuable to collect are successful campaigns, successful marketing and PR. Who is the last person you know of who got three new facilities? Who got the biggest budget increase last year? And then you target those people. And your question to them should not be, although it's a great one, but tell me everything you did. But what data did you pull together? And what was that convincing data? How, how did that tip the scales? What was the tipping point? Which is another book I love. My second comment for how is that your audiences and the people, uh, for the people you are trying to convince, need to be profiled in the next category. You need to know their interests, their particular roles and responsibilities the background that they have, what's their career, what's their profession, what did they do beforehand, what's their educational content, and then their history with your field. 
In other words, have they always been involved in libraries? Do they know anything about you at all? Does that advisory group for your associate vice president uh, know about you? Have they ever worked with libraries? And certainly their knowledge base. And I'm not talking so much about librarianship as I am about those functional areas, student success, technology delivery. So you need to find out in your audiences these elements. And I'm not saying they need to know librarianship. Rather, what is their history with you, but more specifically, their knowledge base for those elements that you feel uh, you need to reach out so definitely the knowledge base for those subcategories, not the entire field. I think that managers should not only create documents, but should create education and literally training plans for target populations. One of the things I do for new administrators is I create, uh, as, and we jokingly used to call it the confetti document, because I had a burst of confetti on the front. But create a series of statements that gave them the snapshot or the overview of my library, but it is, it is couched in the context of the last institution they were in. So I'm currently working on a plan for an administrator. We're really excited about getting to the institution, but my first stop is to take a look where he came from and then create the paradigm shift so that I can I profile him in terms of what is he used to, what is his context. And it doesn't mean that he is most supportive of that. It means it is what he is most used to. Uh, finally here, uh, we may not be the only ones who need to carry that water, so to speak. It uh, certainly is a hackneyed phrase, but it's a very important one. Who should carry the messages that we are creating to those targets. Sometimes a target likes to see himself or herself. An administrator likes a frontline person. They need a constituent. So it's very important to not only identify those issues about the targets, but also who the people are and uh, who they are going to most listen to. I used to uh, I call it stock. Uh, Cialdini and his work on the power of persuasion because his concept of identifying targets and identifying people was just extremely important in uh, putting that message together. So the first thing I know, the first thing when I do public speaking is ask, who am I speaking to and what are their interests and what do they know about me and, and what's their level of knowledge about the functions or the technology or the issues I'm dealing with. Case methods and scenarios are next, the why being relatively obvious here. Um, we talked about, I mentioned that management schools use this as the core foundation of telling the story as a teaching and learning tool, especially in management. And then scenarios as a way to look for the future, speculation, uh, providing information, and scenarios uh, offer evidence-based speculation as much as possible. So that's a critical uh, use of case methods and scenarios. So the question here is, how do you use case, me case methods and scenarios? Gathering stories, uh, I, I first start by telling people, think small. So you've got your target population. And don't think big, think small. What is the most important thing you want to know? What is on the top of your list? So rather than thinking an entire building, and let's convince the powers that be that we need a new building, perhaps what you want to do is meet them in the middle for what is the library's role in student success. So while that is big, you come to them on their table, and you don't start something they're familiar with. You don't start by convincing them of a case that involves getting a new building. I think that we need to gather uh, content for target populations and the match of that data to persuasive techniques. We have a number of wikis and best practice uh, documents, which I'm hopeful people will continue to keep as a uh, significantly updated and dynamic environment so that we can continue, again, to gather the data that they use behind the successful story. So yes, I want to know that you got your bond election. I want to know that you convinced your AVP 
to renovate the first floor of the library, but what I really want to know is what data you used in order to make that work, and then how did you put that data together? Did you create a case method? Did you talk about student success and create a scenario of the increase of use of the first floor and the concept of student success and keeping students on campus by putting together a scenario? One of the reasons why I like case methods is because I think uh, oftentimes needs are best expressed by addressing a problem and a solution. And one of the concepts of Cialdini is they ask you, if you know that someone is, has a negative feeling about what you're doing or building or spending money, when you go to them, do you present them with the positives first and then the negatives? No. Cialdini talks about expressing things through the problem first and the negative first. And a case method does that very successfully. And so what you're looking for is gathering cases that are unique to you and your needs and using them and peppering them with the data that's the most successful. The same is true when you look at scenarios and deciding how you're going to use scenarios to move forward. And so then what we're focusing on is a future. We look at case method as more a snapshot of identifying the situation as it is now or as it was in the past and how you want to solve that problem. Scenarios, on the other hand, are pictures or vignettes or snippets of the future and then the discussion of that future by using best practice data. The third category, which I mentioned was my favorite, is really the visual. And the visuals come in a variety of categories. And the obvious, one picture is worth a thousand words. Um, data really uh, it illustrates, or data illustrates, context, value, use through visuals. And the hardest thing for me as a presenter is to stay uh, plural for data, but you get my drift there. Visuals are considered their own universal language, and it cuts across cultures and ethnicity. It cuts across experience in your organization, and it cuts across the amount of time that you've been working in an area and a knowledge base. So I think visuals uh, have to be part of what you do. And, and visuals can be the chart of the graph, but you also need to understand that technical writing as a visual approach to writing and communication must be employed. The other thing that I think is the why for visual, like paradigm shifts, charts and graphs, is that they very quickly, with one picture, update uh, outdated perceptions. And some of that is that left side of the paradigm, or that top of the paradigm, where you illustrate the way it used to be, or the way it is in somebody's organization, and then you move them down or across the page through comparison and context. The how is relatively easy with visuals. Uh, Edward Tufte is probably the most significant uh, visualization uh, guru that we have. And some of the phrases that I look for are uh, just anything by Tufty. His website is incredible. His materials are incredible. Infographics, which of course are not new in our field, but really hot. You know, the oldest infographic is how a bill becomes a law. Remember the tree that we had and how um, the House of Representatives and the Senate, how the bill becomes a law and moves through that. So infogra infographics are not new. But they are a fascinating concept of um, illustrating the one picture is worth a thousand words, and they are particularly valuable when the people do not have significant background or knowledge of what you're doing and where you're trying to illustrate something important for them. Data visualization is a term that Tufty uses that, of course, is his mainstay or cornerstone of what he does. And then a, a tease out of that is information visualization. Same thing as infographics, but these are the key words for searching, and these are the ways that we really use paradigm shifts, charts, and graphs. Those are the phrases, the overarching phrases that we use. I love, as I said, gathering best practices of successful things, and I, I gather infographics. One of my very favorites was Tufty's infographic of the march of Napoleon uh, into Russia. Fascinating one page, which says in a single word, uh, success and failure of a military campaign. 
in, in putting together this, I looked at some of my mainstays. And Creative Block, BLOQ.com, has 83, is a, is a core list of 83 best practice infographics. Fascinating. Pinterest, oddly, is becoming a management tool more so than many others. And what they have, which is unique, is a lot of infographic examples for nonprofits. And I think that that's a little different now because we're, we communicate different things in nonprofits. The reason why I moved to that uh, probably as more, uh, as most if not more than I do creative block is because what we're looking at for nonprofits is illustrating value and worth rather than profit and loss. So I think uh, nonprofit uh, infographics is, are good. Tufty uh, does a wonderful job of that. And I think his work is probably the most successful in not only illustrating value, but also illustrating outcomes and identifying outcomes as different. Paradigm shifts for me are unique because they illustrate and educate using context. Uh, they illustrate progress. Uh, they, uh, they're not black and white. They afford uh, the viewer gray areas. And they also are excellent as providing baseline information. And what I want to push out is that paradigm shifts are not only the two columns, like before and after, uh, the budget then and the budget now, but certainly the approach to um, taking a look at the three column paradigm shift, which shows the old budget expenditure in the first column, the new budget expenditure, and then the third column being the outcome of that. So paradigm shifts are also significant for illustrating how you move or transition and then what outcome is available. As we said before, matching visuals to target audiences is extremely important. You gather that from what infographic was successful to, uh, to um, make that case for someone to increase a budget. What was it that turned people's minds? Years ago, when I was working in a public library, one of the things that I collected was the story. And more so the case method or scenario, it was the, the child who came in. Or when we did the White House conference in 1990, I was a child then as well, but we did the info uh, graphic there on how a White House conference affects individual states. But we also told the story. The person who in the community was enriched or engaged because of what the library provided from them, increased their literacy. A community college a library that provided resources for someone to move from a GED to a competency-based education program. So we're looking for one-page or two-page ways to present an executive summary, illustrate outcomes and accountability through pictures. Data gathering that focuses uh, on outcomes specifically to illustrate uh, meaningful value. Uh, we really don't need to, to talk a lot about why. I think we're preaching to the choir here. But I will tell you that we need different data. What we have in most libraries is flat data. And what we mean by that is for many years, the number of people that walk in the door, the number of hits on the website, that's one-dimensional data. And yes, it's helpful to say a million point four people used our website last year. But you need the context of that, a million point four with a community of this size, with the number of full-time enrollments versus this size, our distance learners, and they're visiting the site, which in some kinds of software, you can uh, present that level of content, which is great. So what we want to move away from is one dimensional or flat data and present data that has at least two dimensions to it, and data that really focuses on our constituents, not how many books we bought, but how our books support the curriculum, the depth and breadth, how students use materials. That's what we want to focus on. 
So we know that our data uh, needs to illustrate leading us to achieve outcomes, illustrating value, their value, and how they define value, whether of ours. The way to get to this is to first gather the data and create a master list of the data and tools that you have. We cannot continue to add types of data to what we do and gathering data and add software and gather data that's no longer helpful to people. When I did a, kind of a summative look at my data, I found that probably a fourth or a fifth of it really was old. Nobody asked me that question anymore. I didn't convince a target audience with this. Someone that I used to gather this for no longer works for the institution. So it, it's such an obvious thing, but we typically don't jettison data. We weed our collection, but we don't weed uh, the list of data that we keep. And certainly we need different data with what we're asked to account for in terms of um, outcome. Identifying the definitions of value. Now, you and I probably know what value is and what worth is, but what we need to do is absolutely define the concept of value in our organizations, and they vary dramatically per value, excuse me, per organization and per value that we're looking at. So what does student success mean in your organization? What does community engagement mean? What does economic and efficiency mean? What value is placed on those? So oftentimes it's not our definition. It's the definition of the administration and what's happening. We need to gather those definitions. Then what we need to do is match the data that we have to the outcomes that people want. So we've narrowed down our pool of data. We've looked at the outcomes that are required for us. And then we need to see and realize that most of the flat data that we create simply isn't going to make that outcome come alive. That most of the time what we're doing is pulling together two or three pieces of data. And that will assist us in doing our outcomes. So let me give you an example of that if we look at information literacy. Clearly, if our uh, outcomes are students exiting uh, the library's uh, coursework program or students completing the online tutorial on plagiarism, uh, score significantly higher on recognizing the need for citation analysis. So as an outcome, how do I get there? I get there by getting the data. How many people completed the tutorial? What kinds of questions or Likert scales did we have at the close of it? What was the evidence base to that came to that outcome? So we're flipping the traditional data that we have and asking our target populations, and remember we have that profile of our target populations. What does our freshman indicate uh, is plagiarism? Do they know the definition of that? Are they more aware of it? Do they hear it in English? Uh, do they match up the fact they just heard it in a library tutorial with English? So we're really trying to match the data that we have and realize that one piece of data seldom does that. Most of the time, it's comparison of the two. So when we get our flat data, pulling together uh, the worth and value data is critical. And there are a number of best practice documents that use that. The state of Florida used to have an extraordinarily good document that illustrated value of resources. The state of Texas uh, tried to replicate that and came up with value. The state of Colorado has the LRS.org that gathers all those together. Web Junction has that. Now, the Colorado website used to be public. Now it has public, academic, school, special. And the Texas document provides worth or value across types of libraries. Although it focuses on public, it focuses on the function and the resource and the service. So we need to, to pull together those things that we used to pull together to illustrate why we made decisions. I used to go to Bowker once a year and pull the value of a book. What was the average book value? And lately, when we were looking at our e-resource collection, we had defined the value of an e-book. What was that amount? 
So now that's flat data, and what we're looking for is pulling together those value studies that are particularly helpful for us. So we're looking at value of functions, resources, or services. Go beyond your type of library when you're looking for that content. I suggest that when you hit on a value that works for you and you realize that it illustrates your value as well, that you use it in your advertising, marketing, your email signatures so that it is part of your brand. So your value or worth is part of your brand. We recently had an exit survey of our students, and it was an alumni survey. And the library was, it wasn't a no-levitt, which is existing, but it was similar to a no-levitt, where they asked us worth and value. And we were really excited to find out that they valued the library number two, or number three, actually, on their rankings. And I'm interested in working that into annual reports, because it was a significant return on a survey data. It worked very well. We know that SESI and NESI data, NESI's had uh, higher education involved, and we now know that SESI, which is the community college, is uh, getting ready to start a, a program that looks at value and worth of libraries and community colleges. So we really need to push the aggregating of content or worth or value, uh, measure one of the worth or value statements against us, and put it as part of our brand and push that out to other people. The gathering wider varieties of data designed to achieve outcomes is very important. Uh, there have been several sort of landmark uh, institutions and studies that have done this. There are several businesses that illustrate value and data in different ways. And we really need to gather that variety to us and use those given what our administrators value. So if if student success is the issue, then, then you need to determine the outcome and the accountability and how your library supports the student success in the organization and how, for example, I'm going to tie that bow with our alumni identifying the library as the second most important one. So we really have to pull those together and create our own clearinghouse. The fifth area for us is terminology. And I think I mentioned before, most of us do this subconsciously, because what we're looking for here is the wording that we use to, to put our content together. So we, I do have to say that I'm going to rely on some of the older things. No one understands what we do, really. And um, I think many of the misconceptions that we have are how we spend our time, what we spend our time on, and how we do provide an infrastructure for our own individual communities. So we, we have to go with the premise that no one understands what we do. Therefore, we have to re-identify for people based on their context. No one understands our terminology. It's like the, the handshake and the treehouse, the secret handshake. No one understands our acronyms and initialisms. And it's critical that we go through our content to make sure none of our articulation content involves that, so that everybody knows that when we talk about our outcomes, it's in the terminology of the institution or higher education or nonprofits or public environments city, county, we have to make sure that we keep it that broad. And certainly, if we're in partnerships, we're in consortia, and we're putting together goals for those, we all don't even understand what the other ones are doing. So if different types of libraries call, thing, call different things, uh, uh, phrases and words that we don't understand, we need to create a platform of understanding, a dynamic glossary that we can use within our community, within our institution, within our partnerships. We know that our terminology changes very rapidly, and sometimes that's the partnership with the, the consortium. And it, it really does uh, change. And I'm going to use the dog ear change again. It's too hard for people to keep up or understand, so that dynamic glossary is critical. We also need to learn there are better common languages out there than ours. And most of you have already gone to that. You use the technology speak. 
when you're talking about something because everyone's going to understand that rather than you. Online catalog, uh, database. We've, we've gone back and forth when we do advocacy when we're talking to our administrators. Does anybody really know what a database is? Because mostly in business speak, we're talking about access software that creates a database of content. So we have phrases that we use, but it's our common language. So what we want to make sure we do is create uh, the common language within our own institution. And that's going to mean opening the door to include general management, common language, tech speak, financial management, and HR. And then apples and oranges. I've gone to events where I'm trying to convince them of A, and they think I'm talking about B. So it's just critical that we uh, use that. Here are a few steps to how we, in fact, create that terminology of language that we're going to continue to use. One is that we survey our internal groups and find out what they read professionally, and uh, then read their professional content. The first thing I recommend for managers is that they read in my institution, Community College Times, or they read uh, online resources for a chronicle of higher education in public. I think they need to read city and municipality, those things that are what others read. So read what they understand and use their terms, obviously. I'm going to harken back to using the terms and content that you and I found in the data when we found what was the convincing data for um, the best practices. The last person who got funding in my institution, I want to know how they got funding. What is it? What data did they use? And was one of our uh, second areas, but what we're talking about now in the fifth is what terms and content did they use? I, I really think in my environment, student success is huge in terms of, of um, uh, issues. Employability is really big in higher education now. How do libraries contribute to employability? So we need to look at those. In public institutions, we're really talking about community engagement and uh, looking at what works in that environment. K through 12 is obviously going to be able to use higher education in terms of matriculating, graduating, those terms that, that people have uh, built into the natural uh, progress of success in that institution. So one of the things I tell people to do is limit your search. And I, I included five years here, but I'm going to say five years of annual reports or less, maybe three years, and to identify terminology from reports from uh, peer departments, from other organizations. What did they talk about in the last couple of years? And you're going to make that longer, for example, if you've had a president for six years, look at the last six years. If you've had a new AVP of education or academics for the last three years, then use the last three years. So look at the current administration in that pool. If you've had a city manager for two years, look at what has been successful within the county or the city for the last period of time that's meaningful. And then I've mentioned before to create the clearinghouse. And I mentioned earlier that we needed to create that dynamic glossary to train or educate our own people. And then to be able to create that transition from a library term to the business term to term that's most used within that institution. So those are my five tips for people. Um, the, I want to thank you for attending. And I want to uh, push you to uh, the Rowan and Littlefield website because they're uh, on my uh, page advertising the book. Go to the bottom and look under Features. And there are 30 pages of free content that are not found in the book. And these are expanded um, Paradigm shifts that are the big picture paradigm shifts of 21st century libraries. They're paradigm shifts of reference. Uh, there are uh, really a number of different things that I think are very helpful to people. So I, um, I'm, I'm very interested in people getting a taste of what uh, some of the content looks like. So the features, absolutely are um, uh, 30 pages of free content that's going to put you in a direction to, to um, 
see whether or not some of these will work for you. We have a couple of questions here, so uh, they look really good. So I'm going to expand my content, and uh, we've got some good ones. Someone asks, how do I move on from the question page? Uh, I think that's the technology one here, correct? I'm not sure. Um, OK, so uh, let's take a look. OK, given that many of the library's functions can now be automated, and I apologize to you, my screen is going to need to be stretched just a little to get your full good question. Given that many of the library's functions can now be automated, after all it is the digital age, do you have tips on how to justify? Absolutely. When I reviewed my data and my record keeping, what I did was take a look at meaningful issues in regards to the phrase door count. So I added a virtual door count and an actual door count. So what we have to do is go back to that terminology and question. It is the website, it is the tutorial, it is a variety of those things pulled together. So what you can do is create a hybrid of content redefine the concept of door count, use virtual versus actual door count, and then talk about that, but that's flat data. So what you're going to do is match that to um, use of Blackboard in your institution. Uh, in a public library, you would look at it based on the number of people who have library cards, and then approximate number of times people use it based on some IP content from your IP provider. So first start with your definition to see how people can, can look at that. Now, when you spread out the screen, I can see that you wanted to take a look at justifying uh, present staffing levels. Um, as we all know, a misnomer here for uh, uh, how many people does it take to staff a library, the concept, well, that's all online now. You need fewer people. Once you change your terminology and truly define that virtual door count is as important, then what you need to do is to create that paradigm shift of what the, uh, the tech support person used to do in your library or the librarian who does your website or the, who the librarian who does your information literacy used to do and does now. So you're going to have uh, learn software and uh, learn libguides and design libguides, create online environments, monitor RSS feeds, all of those things that are not in your job description, but they are part and parcel of what you do. We just need to make sure the definition really works and that you have a paradigm shift of what people used to do and what they did do. Hi, Janice. How are you doing? I love Anne Arundel, as you know. Thank you very much. I'm glad you thought it was useful. One terminology example I don't think you use is dashboard. Let me talk a little bit about dashboard. Dashboard is a term that became very, very popular when we started to, before Drupal, but when we started to use Flash. And a lot of websites was a dashboard. Dashboard now really means an aggregated portal of, of content that is all concentrated. So you'll see an Office of Institutional Effective effectiveness dashboard that shows a variety of choices. So make sure that the right term is used for dashboard. Absolutely use it, because now what we're looking for is a, a one-page portal that shows you content and where to find it. But let me tell you, label that dashboard with their term. So for example, if you have a, a category that's called Books and Student Success, or information literacy tutorials and student retention, or making that A in mathematics and uh, the LibGuide for mathematics, or online library tutorials. Those kinds of things are important. So use the dashboard, link to measurement and effectiveness, but make sure the terms are kind of the hybrid of library terms so that they can find what they're looking for really quickly. 
Hi, I'm Mara. Nice to see you. Thank you. This is great stuff. Is there any way to follow your ideas on social media somewhere? Thanks so much. Um, you know, I, I'm, you, you stumped me, Mara. Hmm. Not on social media. I don't. Uh, I have a web page that I've been toying with. Uh, I, I have a Twitter account, but don't follow me because I don't care if anybody knows what I ate for dinner. Uh, social media to me is extremely important. I have a Facebook page, but it's primarily a personal one. I have a blog, but it's for my staff, and so it's the introductory piece. Uh, Mara, email me, julie.tadero at yahoo.com. Anybody can who wants to. And we'll talk about keeping up, because there are a couple of ways I can suggest to you that aren't part of this. Other questions? Nice to see people I know there. Really good question. Any answers? How about that? Oh, good. Uh, no other questions. A note and a thanks. Even better. I find it hard to believe I answered all your questions. Librarians usually have fabulous questions. ACRL and choice or typing. I'm asking if there are any other questions. I'm getting directions. The feed is very good. I'm glad you like the content, Nora. Um, you can certainly feel free. Uh, you know, my publisher, Charles, is, is my god, and he would be livid if I didn't say, take a look at my book. Uh, certainly you can request it on interlibrary loan. There's a copy available in paperback. There's a copy available in, uh, on an e-book now. And so uh, start with looking at that 30 free pages on my website, because that's going to give you a real taste. And that is a Word document. And so you can take that Word document. I have not only um, paradigm shifts completed, but I have paradigm shifts that, you know, not that you couldn't erase the column yourself, but paradigm shifts that have columns where you can fill in information with suggestions on how you might do that to create what you need. Laura? Thanks, Julie. That was great. Well, it looks like we are ready to wrap up. I would like to give a virtual round of applause to Julie for sharing some great information. We really appreciate your time and insights with us today. Great. As a reminder, we have recorded today's program, so please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice that will include instructions on accessing the archived version. Thanks again to Julie for joining us today and for all of you out there who have taken some time this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed the session. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, again, Choice is a primary management document for me. Thanks, y'all, for tuning in, and have a good rest of the week. Thank you.